Okay, let's get into our discussion of how recovery works. We're going to have a few assumptions that we're going to make that are going to frame this discussion. The first is that concurrency control will be in effect. In particular, we're going to assume strict two-phase locking. Um, and you might want to ask, after you've seen all these lectures, what would happen if we used a different kind of uh, concurrency control? Obviously beyond the scope of this, this um, class, because we only studied one concurrency control protocol, two-phase locking. But uh, as you learn about new concurrency control protocols in your life, you might want to revisit these slides and think about how recovery interacts with those concurrency uh, protocols. In our discussion, we'll assume strict 2PL. Another thing we're going to assume is that updates are happening in place. That is, when we're going to update a value in a tuple, we'll modify it right in the buffer pool, um, and then the page of the database that we modified will overwrite the old value of the page on the database. So updates are destructive. They're going to happen in place. Um, we're not going to do our transactions on, on private or shadow copies of the data. The updates are going to happen right where the data lives. Um, with the goal of keeping the data organized the way it originally was. Updates shouldn't need to change the organization of the data. All right, let's start with the simplest recovery scheme we can think of. And I often set this out as a challenge to students, but given the format of this class, we'll go through this challenge together. So what we want to do is devise a simple scheme, the simplest one we can think of, preferably one that requires no logging, which is what we're going to learn about next. And we want this scheme to achieve atomicity and durability. Okay, And remember, we're making updates in a buffer pool, and those updates are being written down to the database periodically. And so the questions we might want to ask ourselves are these. What's happening during the transaction? What happens at commit for durability? How do you roll back on a board? How is atomicity guaranteed? And finally, are there any limitations or assumptions in your solution? So if you'd like, you can pause the slides now and think about that and come up with a scheme of your own. We'll go through one together on the next slide. Okay, here's my simple scheme, and it's a pretty natural one. All right, so here's an example of a simple scheme to do this. First rule is that dirty buffer pages are gonna stay pinned in the buffer pool. We're not gonna write anything to the database while the transaction is running. Um, we're gonna prevent the replacement policy from stealing these pages by pinning them in the buffer pool. Uh, oh, by the way, let's use page level locking so we have one transaction per page. So a transaction locks a page and it pins the page in the buffer pool also. So that transaction has total control over that page and no dirty writes are going to the database. Okay. And that's going to avoid a lot of problems, right? We're not going to have corrupted data in the database from incomplete transactions. Okay, now all we have to do is deal with commit. At commit time, what we're going to do is we're going to take all those pinned pages for our transaction, and we're going to force them to disk together. Then we're going to unpin the pages so that the buffer pool can replace them if it wants to. And then we'll commit only after we know all the pages are on disk. And by committing after we write all the pages, we can be sure that we've told the user that uh, the transaction is committed, we know that those pages are flushed down and forced to the database disk. So that's a nice simple solution, right? No dirty stuff gets written to the disk, and we don't commit until we know everything's been written to the disk. So the first property is going to give us atomicity, right? Because we'll never get a partial set of pages written down to the database. And the second part is going to give us durability. If we say commit, we know the pages are in the database. Sadly, the scheme doesn't quite work. Let's talk about why. Well, the first part, we said all dirty pages are going to stay pinned in the buffer pool. And you should have been thinking to yourself uh, from our buffer management lecture, what happens if that buffer pool fills up? Remember, we said in buffer management that we wanted to unpin pages as fast as we possibly could to give the replacement policy the ability, the choices, of what pages to replace. Here, a transaction, if it's a big transaction, is going to pin lots of pages in the buffer pool. A really big transaction could pin all the pages in the buffer pool and still want more, and then it would simply crash. So this is not a scalable solution, right? It can't handle a transaction that touches more pages than we have pages in the buffer pool. And even if we don't worry about scalability, it's limiting the ability of the system to do buffer replacement the way that's most efficient. So if nothing else, it's, uh, it's IO inefficient. But more importantly, it's not scalable. Remember the second part of our proposal, we said at, com at commit time, we want to force the dirty pages to disk and then unpin the pages and then commit. But what if the database crashes halfway through step A? We can't force all our dirty pages to disk all at the same time. That's not how disk drives work. So if we have a transaction that's touched a thousand pages, we're going to have to do a thousand separate IOs. We can certainly have a crash during the time of those a thousand IOs. So this is not really an atomic step step A, step 2A here, right? It's actually a step that can have something bad happen in the middle of it, all right? So we're not actually getting 
atomicity here, because we can get dirty pages written to the database before we commit. Okay, so we're going to have to look for a better solution, one that's both more efficient and more reliable.